at about the age of 20, a young adult will have viewed one million commercials. It is impossible to have a Christian mind if we don't refuse, if we just give in to our lust day in and day out, day in and day out. We must protect our minds. All right, so if you have a Bible uh, with us, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. Uh, we're going to jump around just a little bit um, on this topical message this, this evening. But for the most part, that is going to be our, our, main <clears throat> our main verses that we will, we will gravitate to gravitate to. Um, and again, this is the letter to Corinth, the first letter to Corinth by Paul in the second chapter. I'm going to go back up to verse 14 for a little bit of context. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? And here's the key phrase, but we have the mind of Christ. You either control your mind or it controls you, once said by Napoleon. The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. Anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or 80. Anyone who keeps learning stays young. The greatest thing in life is to keep our mind young. So from Plutarch to Henry Ford, these secular quotes about the power of the mind is at first worth noting. However, we know as believers, a mind without Jesus is worldly. A mind without Jesus is filled with sinful thoughts, even sometimes a mind with Jesus. But Outside of Jesus, we are carnal, we are fleshly, we are lustful in our thoughts and desires. Yet by his miraculous grace, we can be transformed. So the study this evening, you know, while I was talking to Pastor Scott a couple nights ago on certain topics and subjects, um, he thought it would be beneficial and mention the subject of just personal maybe spiritual disciplines to, to go over, and I was grateful for, for that idea and that topic. So I began researching, taking a look at uh, a stack of books that came across, and, and this was actually a, a go-to uh, for me personally. I don't know if anybody has read this, uh, Disciplines of a Godly Man by R. Kent Hughes. So while geared for more of a men's Bible study, uh, this book can really effectively be a group such as this for, for all of us, uh, especially in chapter six, which is primarily what I got and gleaned from this study tonight on the discipline of mind. <clears throat> the Christian in one's mind is filled with thousands of battles each day. So to start off, I'll open up the floor. I'll literally open up the floor for us to answer and, and, and ask. Um, so please feel free. What specific battles of the mind does the Christian face in today's modern world? How does the modern world make it so much more difficult to live in a godly life without a disciplined mind? I'll leave it to you. I'll ask the question again. Go ahead. Lust, in variety of forms and maybe multiple ways. Again, I'll ask the question, what specific battles of the mind does the Christian face in today's modern world? Sales. Sales, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Negative thoughts, just kind of being in your own head and, and just almost seemingly unable to get out of that cycle. Yeah. Depression. Depression. Yeah. 
not considering God in, in everything that we do, absolutely. Good, what else? <clears throat> mm -hmm. A tale as old as time. All the way from the Egyptians and the Israelites, yes. Thanklessness. How about TV? That was my number one. Commercials. By the way, can I go on a little tangent here? So we have YouTube, play for the kids. And, you know, maybe we should go to YouTube for kids specifically, but that's just another app and another thing. But I just can't believe sometimes the commercials that will air when we're explicitly playing children's videos after video after video. You would kind of think that maybe after all these videos of kids material they wouldn't show something but whatever I digress <clears throat> how about social media <laughs> a cesspool 100% movies with a wide range of filth being produced these days limited wholesome music on the radio Limited, wholesome music. I can barely find maybe four or five channels that I can listen to. <laughs> what else? How about the grocery store? Gossip magazines. I can barely... Turn your head and you got a half-naked woman on the cover. Commercialism, convenience, all about me, materialism. <clears throat> in his letter to the Corinthians, as well as writings to the church in Rome, Paul emphasizes this captivating of the mind. To have Christ, renew your mind so that we might have the mind of Christ, as it says in chapter 2. 2 verses 16. This word transformed in the Greek literally means, anybody pronounce that? Except for Pete? So, metamorpho. It's good, yeah, but yeah, meta metamorphos is literally the word transformed in Greek. What does that sound like? Metamorphos, right? What does that make you think of? Change, butterfly, absolutely. From what? A caterpillar, absolutely, yes. So likened to, that was actually very good. Did you see my note? Likened to a caterpillar, transition into a butterfly to change the form of. It is a verb with action. And Paul says it to the church of Rome in chapter 12, verse 2. I'll read that really quick. Verse 1 and 2, actually. This is in the Christian Standard Bible. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in the view of the mercies of God, I urge you, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not, be for, do not be conformed to this age, but be, here's that word, transformed, metamorpho, by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So this word transform, Paul uses as an imperative present tense that is a command. Don't be this way, but instead be this way. Be made new and ask how you may, how would do we do this, Paul? Ask Paul, how do we do this? How do we made new? What does this look like? Well, by literally the discipline of renewing our mind. Well, how do we renew our mind? I'll throw it out there. How do you, how do you how, daily, how do you renew your mind? The word of God. Prayer. 
Yeah. If, if you were to be in a trade or a profession and you wanted to get really good at it, how do you do that? Practice. Practice. Repetition. Why, why do we need repetition? Keeps us, sharp. Keeps us sharp. Can we perfect it immediately? No. no. I mean, some geniuses probably could, but, you know, that's not the most of us here. Re- repetition. Practice. This, this relationship, this bond. That's our connection to 1 Corinthians 2. Because we are, and when we are in Christ, when we are saved, when we are regenerated, we are given the mind of nous in Greek, the mind of Christ. So to quote book, to quote Hughes, excuse me, in this book here, we must lay down our fundamental Christianity in this truth. A Christian mind demands conscious negation. A Christian mind is impossible without the discipline of refusal. I'll read that again. So we must lay down as fundamental to our Christianity this truth. A Christian mind demands conscious negation. A Christian mind is impossible without the discipline of refusal. Does that make sense? I had to read that five times. It is impossible to have a Christian mind if we don't refuse, if we just give in to our lust day in and day out, day in and day out. I'm going to watch whatever I want to watch. Maybe garbage, maybe filth. Is that a good practice that we should have? No. Charles Colson tells us, sitting at dinner with the president of one of the three major television networks, Colson felt he had a tremendous opportunity to influence this man, so he mentioned how millions of Christians were offended by that network's programming. That sounds familiar to what we're dealing with in today's world, right? Knowing executives in TV would have interest in profits, Colson suggested that it would be a good business practice to air the wholesome entertainment geared for family. After all, Colson said, there are about 50 million born-again Christians out here. So he goes on to explain. He looked at me quizzically. I, I assured him that was Gallup's, Gallup poll, latest figure. What are you suggesting, Mr. Colson? Is that we run more programs like, say, Chariots of Fire? Yes, I exclaimed. That's a great movie with a marvelous Christian message. Well, he said, CBS ran it as a primetime movie just a few months ago. Are you aware of such things? All at once I knew I was in trouble. Then he exclaimed, that night NBC showed On Golden Pond. It was number one, with 25.2% of all TV sets in America tuned in. Close behind was My Mother's Secret Life, a show about a mother hiding her past as a prostitute. It was number two, with 25.1%. And a distant third, the big money loser, was CBS's Chariots of Fire at 11.8%. In fact, of the 65 shows rated that week, Dallas was number one, Chariots of Fire number 57. So my companion concluded, where are your 50 million born-again Christians, Mr. Colson? Good question. Where are we? If even half of Gallup's 50 million born and Christians had watched that show with a Christian message, it would have topped the ratings. But the disturbing truth of studies by secular networks as well as the Christian Broadcasting Network is that the viewing habits of Christians are no different than those of non-Christians. Now, this is not to cast dispersions. I'll be very clear. However, we have to wonder why we're not winning people to Christ. Why it seems evangelism is going down these days. Why it seems fake churches and promiscuity and other churches, we'll say in very strategic quotation marks, are running rampant. Where are we? 
Professor Neil Postman of NYU, a media ex expert, says that between the ages of 6 and 18, I, I couldn't believe this, so just tune in here, pun intended. The average child spends some 15 to 16,000 hours in front of a TV. Whereas 13,000 is in school, let alone just a fraction of that is in church or even in a youth program. At about the age of 20, a young adult will have viewed one million commercials. Let that sink in. So what's the point? What's the point of, of me saying this? What's the point of that stat? Well, the effects of TV and media we know are infamous. Shortened attention spans, reduced linguistic skills, as well as reductive creative thought capacities. You gotta wonder why ADD and ADHD are running rampant, it seems, these days. Just saying. The media industry, as we know, parade promiscuity. They parade sex. Sex sells, after all, right? Am I right? We watch buffoon of dads on TV make their way through life with examples of The Simpsons. Malcolm in the Middle, Everybody Loves Raymond, and Seinfeld. At least that was my generation. I'm sure there's other generations that have similarities and other comparisons. It is obvious to see how the culture views the family, how the culture views men, how the culture views women, how they view fathers, husbands, wives, mothers. It is an assault. And they're not even trying to hide it anymore today. It is an assault on God and the created order. So again, I'll be careful. I'll look at my own self. Now is watching TV inherently sinful? I don't believe so. But as Christians, does it help renew our minds to be transformed in the image of Christ when there's a show with rampant nudity, rampant perverse language, gory, almost unbelievable images of violence. And yet at the same time, why aren't we growing in the Lord? You have to make a connection. We ought to be disciplined and be of sound mind. God calls us to dive deep daily into his word and this metamorphosis with our minds will only come through profound exposure day in and day out. It is a process. I'll repeat that. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. It's called sanctification. It's this growing like a child, like a baby has milk, grows, puts his head up, crawls, walks, runs, Wherever you're at in your Christian walk, it's a process. So, it comes with profound exposure day in and day out in God's word with the anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide and bless and anoint our time. We cannot be profoundly transformed by that which we do not know. Psalm 119 97 through 100 says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all of my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. See, there always has to be a balance and a caution. We don't want to be legalistic Pharisees by all means and be going pointing out, well, well you watch this or you watch this. Oh, I can't believe you posted that. I, d -d 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 Is that ever going to be helpful to anybody in this walk, in this faith, in our community as Christians? No, absolutely not. That's why Jesus says, get the log, get the beam out of your own eye. Look inwardly before you can get that little speck out of somebody else's. Obviously, that's metaphorical and hyperbolic and a little bit, you know, what seems as crazy as far as an illustration. 
but it's the emphasis of your own sin, the own, your own depravity in your life before you gently correct someone else. So maybe we be careful. <clears throat> there is absolutely nothing wrong. Again, oh, sorry, I lost my face. Uh, sorry. So again, there always has to be a balance and a caution. However, we do not want to be legalistic Pharisees and begin to rely on our own works for righteousness. Well, I read my Bible once a year. What are you doing? Only good Christians will follow that strictly and never miss a day. Are you kidding? Year in and year out. If you don't complete that come December, well, I can't take you seriously as a Christian. This is the pitfall. You see how Satan does this? He kicks you down. Man, you need to read more. You're not spiritual. What are you doing? Your life is a disaster. Read more. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling convicted. Let me read. Months, months in, months. Oh, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling good. This is so good. Oh, I know this. Oh, I'm going to speak up in Bible study, and I'm going to... If you're not careful, that is an incredibly dangerous pitfall to succumb to. So may we always guard our hearts by the Lord's grace. Obviously, one-year Bible plans are amazing, and they look different for everybody, especially right now. We're only in month two, so there's still time. There's still time. So some have, honestly, a hard time with reading comprehension. Attention spans and making a discipline of reading, it can be a very slow process for some people. In fact, I tried something new this year with a podcast that I'll absolutely recommend that I downloaded. Uh, It is called Through the ESV Bible in One Year by Ray Ortland. So I listened to it. It's literally broken down each day. You know, Matthew, a couple chapters, Genesis, a couple chapters, Psalms, one chapter, it's, it's, it's very enriching. It is, it is literally only 15 and 20 minutes a day. It is fantastic. There are many times that I can follow along in my Bible plan, making it very rich in process as, as I go each day. So sometimes I listen to it, receiving the word, listening to that daily, daily message. And sometimes I have a little bit more time to listen to it and not only listen to it, but follow along you know, in my Bible, which is great. My point is we have... Many plans like our daily bread. So the discipline of daily prayer and study, no matter what it looks like, that's the point. Are you saturated with God's word? What matters is you are being saturated with him and continuing your spiritual walk with him and growing in him and knowing him every single day. So quick exercise. Again, I'm gonna open it up to the floor here. Speaking of spiritual plans and books, Let's go around the room. Um, I would love to see responses to the following questions. What are five books, sacred or spiritual, or even secular books that have influenced you most? Uh, One recently is It's Good to Be a Man by Michael Foster. Michael Foster, It's Good to Be a Man? Yep. Excellent. Well, just, yeah. Blurt it out. (laughs) Excellent. The Bible Code by Franklin Graham. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. He recommended it. Okay, great. Excellent. Cool. Awesome. And who, do you know off the top of your head who's it by? No. That's, that's okay. What else? Come on. Biography of George Mueller. George Mueller biography. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. 
Elizabeth Elliot, great. What else? So of, of these books, my favorites, they have to be Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, Disciplines of a Godly Man, hey, look, how about that? The Conviction to Lead by Albert Muller, Habitudes, Daily Images that Form Leadership Principles. What is your favorite novel? Any favorite novels out there? No? A very real answer. I love it. Science fiction or fiction? Whatever. I have a point to this, by the way. All right, mine, Lord of the Rings, obviously. Of course. (laughs) The Hobbit series. What is your favorite biography? I know you mentioned one. I think we're going to start a book club. I think that's what we decided here. (laughs) Diary of Anne Frank, classic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Armageddon Reef. Reef. Awesome. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, Mine has to be Churchill, The Power of Words by Martin Gilbert. So the point of that is, are you being saturated? Are you reading? If you're not reading, are are you listening to books? And that's okay if you're not. Don't cast dispersions by all means. But... The idea is, is we are being enriched. We're filling our time with something, right? I'll leave you with this. We'll get out, we'll get out early. Don't tell Pastor Scott. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but we have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. We must protect our minds. What an eternal tragedy it is to have a mind that God has blessed us with and to be redeemed by Christ, but yet not have a mind that loves Christ. May we prayerfully commit yourself to reading and hearing God's word daily. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this study. Thank you for the blessing it is to share what an honor it is to share your holy word to your people. What an honor it is to just see the words of Paul as it is inspirational directly from you. Father, we pray for our minds, a powerful tool as it is, that it be renewed, that it be transformed, that we will as a human, a creation of you, we are idle factories and we will replace anything as long as our mind is fixed on it, but that we be disciplined to focus on you, Father. That we have the sound mind of being saturated and filled with your word every single day in prayer, in communion with the saints, that we live a life to walk with you. And God, if that doesn't look pleasing, if whatever we are doing 
You know our hearts. If we are not doing that, convict us. Father, we love you. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, the gospel. We pray all of this in his beautiful name. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church.